the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So we're repeating ourselves, right? He's saying, the, it seems like he's saying the same thing over and over and over. Uh, but he, he is making a point here. He says this, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first love, uh, loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment hath we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. There's a lot here, but if, if we go through the background and you stick with me, We'll get through it pretty quick, and I think, I think we'll see very clearly what John's trying to get across. Let's pray, and then we'll get into the message here this evening. Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for the time we get together. Lord, I pray that you'll help me tonight. I need your help. Um, got a lot of information to cover, and I want to do it concisely, but Lord, I want to do it clearly. So, so the only way that's going to happen is if you help. And so, Lord, I pray that tonight we'll be able to engage our minds. We'll be able to focus. Lord, I pray that you'll help me to be clear, help me to move through your word uh, through this text um, accurately and quickly, but Lord, help it, to, help it to make sense. Lord, I pray that you'll be with those who are not able to be here this evening. Lord, I pray that you'll just help them to feel better, help them to recover. Lord, give grace in this time. Lord, I pray that you'll just be with us now once again. We ask this, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever heard the phrase, actions speak louder than words? Yeah, we, we all have, I would say, and if you haven't, you have now. Uh, the, the idea there is this, that you can say whatever you want to say, but if you're not living it out, then, then you're not actually doing what you say you're doing. And so as I started to think about this, we're at the end of January. How many, how many people like to say that they have a New Year's resolution? Well, we're 24 days in, and how many actions are speaking as loud as the words were, right? So we see this all the time that... That, that we, it's easy to say what you want to say, but when it comes time to back it up, it's a lot more difficult. Uh, how about politicians? Right? We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. Nope. We're not. Right? And so, so we see that a lot with politicians. But to make it a little bit more real, I can say that I love my wife, but if I don't live it out and show her with my actions... Does she feel love or is she loved? Right? And so actions speak louder than words. And, and what's happening here in 1 John is John is trying to explain to the, 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 his beloved children, his little children, these people here that have accepted Jesus Christ as their, as their Savior, that are a part of this church. What he's trying to do is he's trying to explain to them how they can have fellowship with God how they can have a relationship with God. Now, we're not talking about salvation here, okay? I want to be clear about that because these are believers. These are people who have already accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They already believe, and, 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 and we, we've known that as we've gone through the book. But, but what he's trying to say it really is this in verse 3 of chapter 1. If you want to turn back to chapter 1, because we're going to go right through it. If you need a Bible, there should be one under the, the chair in front of you. I think it's page 1064, somewhere in there, uh, if you need that. Uh, but, but here's what he says in, in chapter 1, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, uh, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So he tells us right out of the gate, the reason I am writing this to you is so that you can have fellowship with God so that your joy may be full. He wants us to have joy. Not, not happiness. He wants us to have joy. 
And so he says there's one way that we can have joy, and that's if we fellowship with God. Now, he's going he's gonna to use variations of this word fellowship all throughout the book. And I'm going to let you know what they are because it's important we see them as we go through this book. He's going to use words like abide, right? He says fellowship here in this verse, but what he's also saying is abide. He's going to use words like dwell or dwelleth. He's going to use words like commit or committeth. And these are words that he's saying that all mean the same thing. It means ultimately this, fellowship. This is how you have fellowship with God, right? Don't check out. Stay with me, okay? So he starts using illustrations, light and darkness. If you say that you're walking in the light and you're not acting like Christ, but you're acting like the world, then you're a liar. You can't walk with God and act like the world. You can't walk in the light and be in the darkness. It can't happen that way. And so he says this, if you are going to have fellowship with God, if you're going to have a relationship with God, abide with him, then you're going to have to walk in the light as he is in the light. You're going to have to maintain this relationship with him. Now, here's, here's what we all understand. We mess up. Right? We will mess up. We have messed up. We will mess up again. So what do we do when we mess up? Well, first of all, when we mess up, we are back in darkness. We're separated from Him. So what we do to then walk in the light again is ask Him to forgive us. And when we ask Him to forgive us, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And now we are walking in the light. Okay, so he's, he's making a point here to show us that the way that we abide with him, the way that we walk with him is we walk in the light, the way we fellowship with him is we walk in the light. And so he says this, that when we mess up, we ask for, the, for this forgiveness, he forgives us and we move on. And this is how we know him. How do we actually walk in the light? In chapter 2, he says in verse 3, and hereby do we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. So the way that we know God is by obeying God. We keep his commandments. We do what he tells us to do. We do what he asks us to do. And when we do that, we then know him. Look at verse 5. This verse is so important. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. There is a way that you can tell if you are in Christ. There is a way that you can tell if you are abiding, if you are fellowshipping, if you are dwelling in Christ. And that's this, if you're obeying. If you're obeying Him. If you are obeying Him, then what's happening is the love that God has is being perfected in you. That word perfected doesn't mean sinless. We know that. What he's saying is this, you are complete. We, we can become more and more complete in Christ the more and more that we obey Christ. So the more that we obey His Word, the more we begin to look like Him. And we fellowship with Him. And we abide with Him. And again, when we mess up, we ask Him to forgive us. He forgives us. And we're back to abiding with Him. And so John is just clearing off a spot and he says, look, if you say that you love God, if you say that you are a follower of Jesus, you ought to look like him. At the very next verse, he says this, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. If you're going to abide with Christ, your life's going to look like Jesus looks. Your life is going to uh, have signs of him. Now, look, can we be perfect? No. We can't. We understand that. But we're going to have glimpses of, wow, that was a Christ-like response. Wow, I wouldn't have responded that way. If something happens in our life or something goes down that, that, that everybody goes, oh, how are they going to react? Well, we react like Christ. Why? Because we abide in Christ. We fellowship with Christ. And so because we have this relationship, we then look like Him. Now, that's important. Because there's a lost world out here who doesn't know him. And the only way they're going to know him is if they see him in us. And the only way that they're going to see him in us is if we abide in him. And so he's really just, he's making his case and he's not going to stop. He's going to clarify and clarify and clarify. He says this, this is not anything new. This is the same commandment that you've had from the very beginning. Really, it all hinges on this, love God 
with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor like yourself. So what does it look like for us to abide in him? What does it look like for us to obey his commandments? Here's how it's manifested. We love others. We love them. He says it in verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. So if we are going to walk with God, the outward manifestation of us walking with God is this. We love our brothers. We love our neighbors. We love those around us in a way that the world doesn't love. In a way that they don't understand. How can you respond that way when something negative happens in your life? Oh, I would have lost it if that happened to me. Well, I walk with the Lord. And so that affects how I respond. And so that's what he's trying to get across here. And so he says, ultimately, there's two things that are going to get in the way of you having a relationship with God, of you abiding or fellowshipping with God. Number one, it's this, the world. Look at verse 15 of chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth, or abides, in the will of God, abideth forever. So he's saying this. There's, one thing, there's two things that get in the way. Number one, it's the world. It's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. If you allow these things in your life, if you allow them to characterize your life, then what's going to happen is you are going to then abide in them. And if you abide in those things, in the world, in sinful things, if your life is characterized by those sinful things, it cannot be characterized by Christ. Because you are walking in the darkness, you are not walking in the light, right? Brother Calden always makes fun of me when I preach because I always do this. It's this or this. I can't help it. It's right here. This is what he's saying. Dark, light, abide in the world, abide in Christ. I'm sorry. He did it, not me. Thanks for the complex, Brother Calden. <laughs> Moving right along. So he says this. The world can get in the way. And look, it can. We know this. As we're walking, there are things that we face, temptations and different things that we face that we fall to. And they fall under one of the three categories, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, or pride of life. So we're familiar with this. That's one thing that can get in the way of you having fellowship with God. The other thing is this, false ideas. Right? We talked about this last Sunday whenever I preached. These false ideas or Ideas that are anti-God or ideas that are anti-Christ as he puts them. These ideas or these people, these false prophets in that time were trying to pull people away from their relationship with God. So not only is it the world that can get in the way of me having fellowship with God, but it's worldly ideas or it's these anti-God ideas that can also get in the way. If you're looking at it, verses 18 really through verse 27, 28 uh, of chapter 2 are talking about these antichrists, these little antichrists who are getting in the way of people having relationship with God because they think that they know better than what God's word says. That's what these antichrists are doing. They are bringing up ideas that sound good that look good, but here's the problem. They're anti-God. You can't back them up with Scripture. They actually go against Scripture. And so he says you need to be aware. There ought to be a little red flag or a little light that goes off when you hear these ideas because we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us. When we get saved, and this is what these verses explain to us, when we get saved, the Bible talks about this, the Holy Spirit indwells us. We believe that when we ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us, and to, uh, to save us, and we believe in Him, what happens is God moves in, right? And God lives within us. So the Holy Spirit is in us, and when we hear these false ideas, the Holy Spirit goes, that's not right. And if you remember, this was probably over a year ago when we talked about this, but if you remember, the, the idea was this, that when you hear it, 
There's something that goes off saying, hmm, something's not sitting right. Now, you might not be able to give a Bible verse or a specific reference at that time to say, oh, I can quote the verse right now of why that's not okay. But something in your soul says, hmm, something's not right. Something's, something's, not, something's not checking here. Uh, so, so something's wrong. He says, don't ignore that. When that happens, keep your guard up. Why? Because these people are trying to pull you from your relationship with God. Again, we are not talking about salvation. We're talking about day-to-day walk with God. And these people are trying to pull you from that walk with God. And so I love what he says in chapter 2, verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you. Hear that word? Abide. Well, let what abide in you? Which ye have heard from the beginning. If that ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Well, what's he talking about there? What commandment is he talking about? Love God. Love other people. That's it. So don't forget that. Just keep doing that. Well, how? Obey Him. When He says to do something, do it. When He says change something in your life, then change it. Don't just let it go. Make the changes that He wants you to make. And when you do that, you are obeying His commandments. This isn't anything new. It's the same one as the old one. You're obeying His commandments. And when you're obeying His commandments, you are abiding in Him. So this is the process. And these are the two things that want to get in the way of this process. The world and those ideas or those people that are anti-Christ, that are anti-God. And I love what he says here. He he, he clarifies at the end of chapter 2 and verse 28, Now little children, abide in him. He, He says it again. Abide in Him. Why is it important that we abide in Him? Why do we have to walk with God? It would be a lot easier if I didn't have to obey, right? My kids can make this argument. They like to make this argument. It would be a lot better if I didn't have to obey, right? Look, I'm going to stop picking on my kids. I make this argument. If I'm just being honest, I go through my life going, oh God, it would be a lot easier if I didn't have to obey today. Especially when I drive. I don't. (laughs) Moving right along. (laughs) I'll get in the flesh real quick. Abide. Why? He says in verse 28, that when he shall appear, ye may have confidence. Confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Jesus is coming back again. He will take us to be with him. And so here's why we abide with him. So the world can see the light that's in us. And so that we can have confidence that when he comes, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just obeying you. I'm just living the life that you've asked me to live. I'm just doing what you've asked me to do. I'm being the light that you've asked me to be. And I love this because in chapter 3 he gets overwhelmed. He just, he takes a minute and he says, time out for just a second. And he says this, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. He gets overwhelmed with this idea that not only do we get to abide with him, not only do we get to fellowship with him, not only do we get to experience real joy by knowing God, we are his children. We don't deserve to be his children. We don't deserve to be allowed to fellowship with him. But not only do we get to fellowship with him, we are his children. When when we get saved, when the Holy Spirit moves in, we're adopted. And that ought to be exciting. I'm clearly not conveying it well enough or we would be more excited. We're going to move right on. He says this, beloved, verse 2, chapter 3, Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear yet what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that hath this hope, what hope? Salvation, a relationship with God. We are one of his children. When we have this hope, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Please don't check out. I'm going to gather you back up. We're we're almost there. We're a chapter away, okay? Here's what he says. And I'm going to quote Brother Jason Gaddis. He said it this way. What we shall be, we should be. 
Okay? He kind of takes a, a second here and he kind of shifts gears. It feels like it doesn't fit with everything else, but it actually fits unbelievably well. What we shall be, which is glorified to be like Christ, that's what he said in verse three or verse two, to be like Christ, what we shall be, we should be. We should be purifying ourselves. We should ought to try to be like Christ. What's another way we can say it? Obey. Abide. Fellowship. He's saying the same thing. Why should we do that? Because the world needs to see Christ. And they can't see him unless they see him in you. We have to do this. Number one, because he did it for us. We are adopted. We are his children. And so because he did it for us, we ought to want to do it for them. So what we shall be, we should be. And I love what he does here because this is just, really it's beautiful writing in the rest of chapter 3. It's another one of those turns and it gets really wordy. So we're not going to get too much into it. But, but this is what he ultimately does. He shows us examples of the two things that get in the way of our relationship with God. He shows us the world and how it affects us, and he shows us antichrists or anti-God ideas and how they affect us. So really quickly, let's look at verse 4 of chapter 3. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Okay? Everybody with me? I know we're a lot of information, and I know we're zooming. But here's what he's saying. God didn't sin. He's perfect. We believe that. This is the weird wording. Verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him neither known him. Verse 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. These are weird verses. These are weird verses. He just said, if I abide in him, if I have fellowship with him, if I walk with him, if I have a relationship with God, I can't sin. That's what he said. That's what it looks like. He said this, if I commit sin, then it looks like I'm walking with the devil. Now, what's that word committeth? Abideth, right? That's one of the words, abide, dwell, fellowship, right? These are one of the words. Here's what he's saying. He's not saying that it's impossible for a Christian to sin. It's what it looks like, but that's not what he's saying. He's saying this, your life is going to be characterized by one of two things. It's either going to be characterized by sin or it's going to be characterized by love. That's what it's going to be characterized by. It's going to be a manifestation of who you walk with. Your life is going to be characterized by the one you walk with, by the one you abide with. He's, say, he's staying in the idea of abiding. Here's what he's saying. If you're walking with God, you're going to look like Christ. If you're walking in the light, you're going to look like him. Your life is not going to be characterized by sin. Your life is going to be characterized by love. Loving one another. Loving your brother. If you walk in sin, your life is characterized by sin. That means this. You don't love. You don't love your brother. You don't love others. So he's not saying that it's impossible to sin or it's impossible to do wrong. He's saying this. Who you abide with is going to be manifested by how you're living your life. That's it. That's what he's trying to get across. And he, he, he goes through a bunch of these verses, and he's trying to make it as clear as he can. Look at verse 11 of chapter 3. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. He's saying, I want your life to be characterized by love, not by sin. Look at the next verse in verse uh, 12. Not as Cain... By love, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one who slew his brother. Don't be like Cain and kill your brother. Don't be like Cain and hate. You see the examples? 
Walk with God. Fellowship with God. Walk in the light. Obey His commandments. Abide in Him, and your life will be characterized by love. If you abide in sin, your life will be characterized by sin. Your life will manifest sin. It will be... It will look a lot like this, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. If you've got sin in your life that just controls you, if, it, if, you, if you have prayed over and over and over, God, please forgive me. I'll never do it again. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll do my best. I, I'm sorry yet again. And then you find yourself falling over and over and over. If this is how you're living your life, then you are not abiding in him. You are abiding in sin. Your life is being characterized by it. Your li- it is manifesting itself out of your life. Everybody with me? Is this making sense? This is what he's trying to get across. This is the, what he's trying to explain to us. Verse 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life by abiding in him. Hereby, verse 16, perceive we the love of God. Here's how we see it. Here's how we perceive it. Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Oh, I love this. Verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Your actions speak louder than your words. You can say you love God. You can say you walk with Him. You can say you're in the light. But if your life is characterized by sin, you're a liar. That's what he said in the book. That's what he said in the first part. You can't hide how you, how, what is manifested in your life. You can't hide who you're abiding with. You can say it all day long, but your actions speak louder than your words. Look at verse 23. And verse 24 of chapter 3. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. And he that keepeth His commandments, he, he who obeys, he that keepeth His commandments, dwelleth in Him, abides, fellowships, committeth, dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. The truth is, I'm sorry to tell you this, I could have just read those two verses and not gone through all of that background. Because he gave it to us all right there. In two verses. Sorry. Here's what he said. Believe in Jesus, love one another, obey. That's what we're supposed to do. That's how we abide. That's how we fellowship. That's how we have joy. That's how the world sees God through us. So we just spent a whole chapter looking at how the world can pull us from God. And last Sunday morning, we spent the first 10 verses talking about how the world's ideas can pull us away from God. We're not going to take a lot of time here, but he said this, believe not every spirit. Don't believe these ideas, every idea, but test them. That little radar goes off, that little red flag pops up, test it. How? Take it to scripture. See what God says about it. If you're here that Sunday morning on Pastor Appreciation Sunday morning, this is what we talked about, so we can really fly through this part. Here's what he said, test it. And you're going to find out if it lines up with Scripture, then it's of God. If it doesn't line up with Scripture, then it's not of God. It's pretty straightforward. This can be overwhelming, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This can, get, this can feel like everybody's leaving. This can feel like, like there's not a lot of truth in the world. It can feel like you're kind of alone and there's not a lot of hope. But when you get overwhelmed with that, take comfort because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Verse 4, the ideas of the world make sense to the world in verse 5. But the ideas of God make sense to those who abide in him. Verse 6, and then he says in verse 7, beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. So what's the idea there? I'm going to go back just for a second. You're going to be characterized by two things. 
you're going to be characterized by sin or you're going to be characterized by what? Love. Right? That's what he said. The, one of those two things is what you're going to be characterized by. You can't just say, I'm going to be characterized by love. Your actions will show whether your life is characterized by love or whether your life is characterized by sin. So here's what he says. It has to be in truth. There's false ideas that go around that say, love is this, you just accept me. Right? We talked about that Sunday. Love is just, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not, not only accept, but affirm. Right? The world's definition of love is this. You have to accept me the way that I am. The world's definition of love is not only do you have to be okay with the way that I am, you have to affirm the way that I am. That's not God's definition of love. God's definition of love is based in truth. And God's definition of love is this. Sometimes it's difficult to hear, but it's this, that we need a Savior because we are sinful. We make mistakes. We do wrong. And so sometimes love can be, can, uh, can be construed as harsh. Sometimes love can come across as mean. Sometimes love can come across as hurtful. Well, you're not being very loving well, actually, I'm just telling you the truth. And that's me showing you the love that I have to show you because we have to do it God's way. We can't do it the world's way. That's what we talked about. Well, how did God show his love? Verse 9 of chapter 4. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because God sent his only begotten son of the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is the love that God wants the world to see, that Jesus came and he died for them. So your life is going to be characterized by love, true love, not an accepting love or an affirming love, but the true love that Jesus is Lord or sin. Okay? That was a lot. But I told you if we can get through that, this is going to be fast. This is going to make a lot of sense now. And it's going to be so clear. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 10. At the end of verse 10. But he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation of our, uh, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, if God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us, we ought also to love one another. Okay? He's, he's resetting here, and he's kind of giving us a little bit of a, a boost now. He's giving us a command. He's trying to tell us how we ought to start living our life. If God loved us so much that he died for us, then we ought to love other people. Not love them the way they want to be loved. Love them the way that God wants them to be loved. Show them the truth, right? Let them see that God loves them. We ought to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. That's weird. Why would he say that? No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, if we're going to truly love the way that God wants us to love, then we're going to dwell in Him. We're going to abide in Him. We're going to walk with Him. We're going to fellowship with Him. If we're dwelling with Him and He's dwelling with us, then this is how His love is perfected in us. This is how His love is made complete in us. And so we become complete in Christ the more that we obey Him, the more that we abide with Him. And the more that we abide with Him and the more that we obey Him, the more that we look like Him. And when our life is characterized by love and looking like Christ and not by the world, then it doesn't matter if anybody's ever seen God in the flesh. What matters is they see God living through us. They see God through us as we obey Him, as we look like Him, as we walk with Him, as we fellowship with Him, as we abide with Him. So he says this, they don't have to see God. They see God through us. 
as we live for Him the way that we ought to live with him, uh, for Him, as we abide with Him, as we fellowship with Him. And then he just goes to preach, and here in verse 15 he says this, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in Him, and He in God, and we have known, and we have believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. He says this, we know God, we know the love that God has shown to us. Why? Because we've already believed it. We've already experienced it. We have have God dwelling in us, not only do we have God dwelling in us, we are adopted. We are His children. Behold what manner of love. We get to live it out. Not only do we get to be called His child, but we get to walk with Him. We get to fellowship with Him. We get to have a relationship with Him. And so he's just going here and he says this, God is love and He dwelleth and He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in Him. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect. This is how we are complete, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. We talked about this. Jesus is coming back. Why should we ab abide in Him? So that we're not caught, not doing what we're supposed to be doing. So that we can have boldness, so that we can have confidence in chapter 2. So that we can have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in this world. We shall be like Him, for we shall be... Uh, I said it wrong. We'll see Him and we'll be like Him. Chapter 2, we just talked about it. That's what he said. But he says this, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Well, why would I be afraid to stand before God if I'm abiding in him, if my life is characterized by true love, the true definition of love, if I'm walking with him, if I'm obeying with him, if I'm obeying him, if I'm living the life he wants me to live, I've got nothing to be afraid of. When he comes back, I'm just doing what he asked me to do. There's nothing better than a clear conscience. There's nothing better than just knowing, hey, I obeyed. This happened very few times in my life when I was a child growing up. But there were a couple of times when I heard a yell and I knew something bad happened and I knew it wasn't me and I went, hey, it wasn't me. And I came walking out because I'm innocent. I've got nothing to be afraid of. Why? Because I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. As rare as that was, it happened once, maybe twice. But there's no fear. Why? Because I'm doing what he asked me to do. And so I'm not going to be caught. I get to have boldness. I get to live with confidence. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. If, any, if a man say... Look at verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother. Does this sound familiar? Been talking about it a lot. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. It's not possible. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Does it make sense? If I'm not abiding in Him, I'm not going to love. If I say I'm abiding in Him and I'm not loving, my life is not characterized by love, I'm a liar. And look, you can say whatever you want to say, but actions speak louder than words. And how your life is manifested and what is manifested out of your life is what is a clear picture of who you're abiding with. I don't think it's an accident that he says this, if a man say. We can't just say it. We have to live it. We can't just proclaim it. We have to let it permeate our life. We have to live it out. Verse 21, and this is the commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. Here's what he's saying. Abide. Fellowship. Walk with him. Obey him. If you live your life in obedience and in fellowship with God, you will naturally love 
your brother. And it doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you do. If you are over here and you are living in sin and your life is characterized by sin and you say that you love God but you hate other people or your life manifests hatred or sin or wrongdoing, you're a liar. You don't actually love him. You can't hide. There's no hiding here. There's only abiding. So what do we do? We abide. Well, why is this important? Why is it that big of a deal? I mean, if he's really laboring here to make such a big deal out of this, why does it matter? Because no man has seen God. Because the world doesn't want to believe in him. But here's one thing the world can't deny. The world can't deny when somebody who ought not to be able to forgive, forgives. That doesn't come from humanity. That doesn't come from our sinful flesh. That doesn't come from us naturally. It doesn't just sprout out of certain people just because they're born that way. I'm sorry, that's just not a natural human tendency. The only way that we can truly forgive somebody is because we have been forgiven by God. And so as we abide with Him and as we forgive as He forgave, as we treat others the way that He treated us, as we live the way that He wants us to live, this is how it looks. Different. It looks different. And the world has to acknowledge that's not coming from us. I certainly wouldn't react that way. I certainly wouldn't respond that way. I don't know where that's coming from. It looks a little different. And it might just have to come down to this, kind of like Nebuchadnezzar. Whenever that music played, and he looked down and he goes, well, the fourth one looks like the Son of God. How did he know what God looks like in that furnace? I don't know. How did the world, how does, let me pause. Let me gather. How does your coworker know who you look like? I don't know. But they know, mm, that must be God. As you're living the way that you are supposed to be living. I hope that made sense. We just have to abide. That's it. We just have to love. May our lives be characterized by love. May our lives be characterized by our actions, not by our words. I know we've gone a little bit here, but, but here's, the, here's the point. Abide. Obey. And let God take care of the rest. The only way they're going to see him is through us looking like him. So let's just live for him and let our lives be characterized by God. Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for the message that we've heard. Lord, I know that...